Come in. Settle back. It's curtain time at the Story Lane Theater. You've never seen a stage like this one. Anything can happen here. Today we're going to watch the story of Finn the Cool, Ireland's most famous giant. We'll visit Finn's home on Knockmany Hill and watch as Finn and his wife Una prepare to do battle with the powerful and terrifying giant Cucullin. But before we see the story, let's share a few moments with two of the musicians who perform the music you'll be hearing in the show. The man playing the tin whistle is an Irish musician named Cappel McConnell. And the man playing the accordion is Dave Richardson, who comes from England. They both travel all over the world, performing with a group called the Boys of the Lock. Let's hear Cathal and Dave tell us more about their music. Got my musical interest from my father, no doubt about that. My father was called Sandy McConnell. He was a good singer. He played the whistle, and in his younger days he played the accordion. When um, my father got me a little tin whistle for Christmas, it seemed that the, the whistle was the right instrument for me to play. If you look at music in, in any culture, music is a way of communication. It's, it's a way of expressing ideas or emotions. And uh, lots of people like to listen to music because it reflects things that they feel or things that they think. If we look at Irish music uh, as we see it now, or as we hear it, it's been handed down for hundreds of years, and it's still in very good condition. I think this is because people in Ireland continue to live, many of them, in the country, and the old ways survive, the old ways of meeting with one another and talking to one another, playing music together. I first heard the story of Finn McCool from my mother. It's a dramatic sort of story. It's a story of the impending battle of the two giants. It's a bit of a challenge, um, putting music to a story, because you really have to think about it. We tried to decide what kind of music w would fit these characters to support the, the story that was being told. We think about the bad guy, Kukulin, and we think of dark, heavy, sinister music for him, and, and we thought of maybe using very low notes on the instruments. We used a little instrument called an accordion and used the bass on it. He looks dark, menacing. You wouldn't want him coming to your birthday party. He's the guy who'd steal all the cookies. For Finn, we wanted something a bit more light and comical. He looks like he'd be a lot of fun. And uh, at the same time, he doesn't look too street smart. I think he misses one or two things in life. So we decided to use lighter instruments, like the tin whistle. The wife of Finn, she's a very good friend to Finn. She's his best friend. That's why he married her. She's a very busy woman, active, happy, she's very content. So we chose light instruments and very light rhythms like the jig and the polka. This business of writing tunes is unusual. You don't actually take out a pen and paper and write them. You sit with an instrument in your hand and your fingers on the instrument and you move your fingers around and suddenly a little piece of melody catches your ear and you think, I like that, that's the start of an idea. And then it might all click together, you know, it's just like making up a little poem or something. Playing this music gives a lot of pleasure to a lot of people. As time goes on, it's, it's been played more and more. There are an awful lot of young people learning this music now much more so than when I was young. It's very interesting to, to think about what we get from music as people. 
I think it reminds us of how much like other people we are. They can be people in other countries in the world, or they can be people who lived in the past. They can play you a tune or sing you a song, let you hear a melody, and you know that they're the same kind of person as you. And now, here come the sounds and sights of Finn McCool. the most famous champion Ireland ever knew. Finn was a giant be sure, but when he was born, he was no bigger than a fire-breathing dragon. And as giants went in those days, that was a mite on the wee side. Now King Cool was Finn's father. And being a famous Irish giant himself, he took the lad's small size to heart. I have a boil on me flank that's bigger than he is, said King Cool on seeing the boy for the first time. King Cool was so distraught over Finn's size that he took the child to the castle parapet, wiped the potato-sized tears from his eyes, and gently punted him into the lock below. Now the grandmother of the lad, King Cool's mother, just happened to be on the shore watching as the infant plunged into the water. Why, that's me own flesh and blood splashing about there, she said, and immediately dove in. In two shakes of a lamb's tail, she dragged the child out of the lock and rushed away with him deep into the woods. Finding a nice stout tree, the grand dame took out her hatchet and chopped a chamber within it. And there the two of them lived. For years the old woman lovingly fed Finn a diet of tree bark, peat, and the occasional grub. But the child thrived nonetheless. After some time the boy rather outgrew his surroundings and it was then that his grandmother knew it was time to send him out into the wild and cruel world. Now such an inauspicious beginning to a life has been known to spoil a man's disposition entirely, but not young Finn. He thanked his grandmother for looking after him, kissed her gently upon the head, and set out to distinguish himself as a great hero. Why, he was as strong as two dozen oxen, and as swift as 43 hares, and he trekked all over the emerald countryside, taking a glen at a step, a hill at a leap, and locks at a bound. Before too long, Finn took a wife for himself, and her name was Una. Una was a beauty, as they say, and a giantess herself. Aye, and that sun-kissed lass was a clever one, too. They were a matched pair, they were, with Finn's brawn and Una's brain. Together they lived quite happily upon the top of Knockmany Hill in Ulster. People always wondered why it was that Finn had selected such a windy spot for his dwelling. Now Finn made his share of excuses for choosing to live in the middle of nowhere, but the real reason Finn made his home atop Knockmany was to see Cacullan coming. Oh, Cacullan, 
It sends shivers down me spine to even utter the name. Colin. No other giant in all of our could stand before him. It was said, and I personally know for a fact is true, that by a single blow of his fist, he once flattened a thunderbolt into the shape of a pancake. He always carried it about with him in his pocket. And before he got into a fight with one of his foes, Cucullin would show them the pancake, just to give them a notion of the kind of pulp in they're about to receive. Cucullin had given every giant in Ire considerable tarring. Everyone, of course, but Finn himself. But that was only owing to the fact that whenever Cucullin went after Finn, our hero would run in the opposite direction. Now, at this time, Finn was building the causeway from Ireland to Scotland. It was a grand undertaking, even for Finn. So he had his band of champions called the Fenians assisting him. One day down at the causeway, Finn and his men were rearranging the coast and, and moving a few small cliffs when he began gnawing upon his thumb. You see, this is how Finn called upon his singular gift for prophecy. Whenever he got into a fix and he couldn't fathom the choices that life so often presents, he would suck his thumb for inspiration, and a most curious thing would occur. He would see the future before him as clear as day. For it was in his thumb that his power for prophecy resided. Now at that precise moment, Finn had divined from his thumb that Cullen was coming to the causeway to do battle with him. And it was just then that Finn discovered a very warm and sudden fit of affection for his wife. I need to see me love and Erna, said Finn. My thumb tells me so. Me think she's in danger. But Finn, pleaded Conan the Bald, one of the Fenians, what about the causeway? Alas, it was no use. Finn was already well on his way to knock many. God save all here! Musha Finn, said his wife. Welcome home to your own Una, you darling bully. And what brought you home so soon, Finn? Why, my sweet Rose, nothing but the purest of love and affection for ye, of course. After Finn spoke, he clapped his thumb into his mouth. Finn, sweetness, said Una, please don't do that while you're talking to me. It's not polite. He's a-coming, said Finn. I see him below Dungannon. Who's coming, said Una? Who are you talking about? It's that nasty Cucullin it is. Oh, oh, it's said that when he gets angry and begins to stamp, a dozen earthquakes erupt. And when he does battle with thunderbolts, he flattens them into tiny pancakes and then eats them with honey, a whole hive of it and with the bees still buzzing inside it. Gracious, the brute, said Una. I don't know how I'll manage. If I run away again, I'll be disgraced before me people. And me thumb tells me that I must meet him sooner or later. Well, my bully, don't be downcast, said Una. Leave it to me and I'll bring you out of this scrape better than you might on your own. Now, it so happened that Una had a sister named Granua, who lived upon a hill called Cullamore, just opposite Nogmany. The beautiful valley that separated the two sisters was only four miles wide, and so on a summer's evening when they wanted to talk, Una and Granua only had to put their heads out the windows of their homes. Granua, are you home? said Una. I am, sister dear, said Granua. And how have you been today? Well, not so well, I'm afraid, said Una. Would you do us the favor of looking about from your window and telling us what you see? Why, nothing, sister dear. "'Tis only a mountain coming over this way,' said Granua. "'Nothing to trouble yourselves over.' "'A mountain? That's no mountain,' said Una. "'That's the giant Cacullin, and he's coming to leather our fin. "'Perhaps if you delay the brute, it'll give me a moment to think. "'Why don't you ask him up for a bite?' "'I only have fifty pounds of butter, and it's not nearly enough to make a cake for that giant,' said Granua. "'If you toss me over a ton or two, you'll oblige me very much.' So Una got the largest tub of butter she had and called up to her sister. Granua, are you ready? said Una. I'm going to throw now. 
Una gave the butter a mighty heave. But in her anxiety over Cucullin, she forgot to say the magic words that were to make it fly to Granua. And so the butter landed with a thud halfway between the two hills. My curse upon your baleful butter, cried Una. You have disgraced me. And with that said, the butter turned instantly to stone. It lies there today exactly as it came out of Una's hand, with the mark of her four fingers and thumb imprinted upon it. Never mind, said Granua. I'll do the best I can to stall Cucullin. So Granua baked her cake anyway and signaled Cucullin to come up to Cullimore. She cut the cake before the giant, and without so much as a thank ye, miss, Cucullin threw it into his mouth and devoured it in one frightening bite. Needs butter, he grunted, licking the last crumbs from his fingers and proceeded on his way. In the meantime, Finn was in quite a panic on Knockmany. Una, can you do nothing for me? Where's all your invention, woman? Will I be skivered like a rabbit before your eyes and have me name disgraced forever before all of Ireland? How can I fight a man who scares the fire out of thunderbolts? There now be easy, Finn, replied Una. I've got an idea. Just leave it to me. With that, Una went to work. First, she rummaged about and found 21 iron griddles. Then she took the griddles and kneaded them into the middle of six loaves of bread. She then baked the loaves on the fire, setting them aside in the cupboard when they were done. Finally, Una took a large pot of new milk, which she made into curds and whey, and then whispered something into Finn's ear. And just as Kukulin was coming across the valley, Una fetched a baby's cradle and instructed Finn to lie down in it. Say nothing and follow me lead. I will, but I don't like it one bit. Just as he was getting settled, Kukulin burst through the door. Be this the home of the great Finn McCool? he asked. Aye, it is indeed, said Una, but he's not in at the moment. Someone told him that a big bassoon of a giant called Cucullin was down at the causeway looking for him, so he rushed away to catch him. Can I help ye? I am Cucullin, said he, looking puzzled. And I've been after your husband for twelve months. Una let out a loud, mocking laugh <laughs> and looked at him as if he was only a little pip of a man. If you take my advice, you poor looking creature, you'll pray day and night that you may never see him, said Una. It'll be a black day for you if you do. Ha! <laughs> snorted Cucullin, dismissing Una's warning. Ah, now the wind's blowing against the dar, said Una. Seeing as how Finn is away from home, would you be civil enough to turn the house around? Now, this request took Cucullin aback for even he didn't do this sort of task on a daily basis. Nevertheless, he pulled the little finger of his right hand three times and went outside. He then put his massive arms about the house and with some effort turned it in a position favorable to the wind. Thank ye kindly, said Una. Uh, please stay and have a bit of me humble fare. Even though you and Finn are enemies, he would scorn me if I didn't treat you kindly in his own home. Una brought Cucullin to the table and placed before him the half-dozen loaves of bread she had baked, together with ten sides of bacon and a stack of steaming cabbage. Cucullin greedily stuffed one of the loaves into his mouth and took a tremendous bite. When Cucullin's teeth struck the griddle that lay in the middle of the loaf, the entire house shook. Oh, blood and fury, shouted Cucullin. And just what sort of bread is this you've given me, I might ask? What's the matter? said Una. Matter? shouted Cucullin. Why, what's the matter indeed? Here are the two best teeth in me head smashed to smithereens. Oh, it's a pity that I forgot to tell you that nobody but Finn himself can eat it, and his little mite who sleeps in the cradle over there. Take your bread away, or I'll not have another tooth in my head. Now, now, said Una, don't be waking the child with all your belly aching. Then Finn gave a shriek that startled the giant, 
<coughs> now you've gone and done it, you've awakened him, said Una. Ma, said he, I'm hungry and I want something to eat. Una went to the cradle and gave Finn one of the loaves of bread that had no griddle in it. After a few bites, he realized it was safe and made the rest of the loaf disappear in two bites. Cucullin was thunderstruck, and by the look on his face, Una knew her plan was working. I'd like to have a look at the lad in the cradle, said Cucullin. Any child who can manage that bread isn't good fighting trim. Get up and say hello to our guest, me lamb, said Una, motioning to Finn. It's terribly shy when company comes. Not many travellers get up our way, you know. Finn crawled out of the cradle and toddled over to Cucullin. Are you strong as me, da? What a booming voice in such a young babe. Just a touch of the whooping and cough, Una explained with a smile. Then Finn grabbed a white stone and handed it to Cucullin. Can you squeeze water out of this white stone? said Finn. Now Cucullin was puzzled. But as he intended to humor the lad, he took the stone and squeezed it as hard as he could. But it was no use. He might be able to turn the house around or flatten a thunderbolt into a pancake, but squeezing water out of a rock was something else entirely. You call yourself a giant? Me da can do it, and he has showed me how. Give me that stone. Finn took the stone from Cucullin and then slyly exchanged it with the curds, just as Una had instructed. And he then squeezed the curds until the whey squirted out in a little shower from his hand, clear as water. I don't care to waste my time with a giant the likes of you. You'd better be out of here before me dog comes back, or else he'll make porridge of you and serve you for dinner. Now, Cucullin was taken quite aback. He's a lucky man, to be sure, to have such a handsome wife and a son who snacks on iron and squeezes water from dry stones. I see I have misjudged him terribly. If it's all the same to ye, I think I'll stay a bit for Finn's return. It would do me proud to make the acquaintance of a great hero such as he, and I shall have to apologize for chasing him hither and yonder for all these months. Yes, apologize I must, even if it takes Finn a fortnight to return. With that, Cacullin sat next to Finn's cradle and rocked it, somewhat roughly as giants will do, and hummed a soothing giant lullaby. Poor Finn saw his very life pass before his eyes. Oh, me bones! What is wrong with the child? asked Cacullin. Um, uh, the poor lad is teething, said Una. His gums have been smarting lately. There's nothing that can be done. I'm not so sure of that, said Cucullin. Me own dear mither had a little trick she used when me choppers come up. With that, Cucullin reached for the flask of spirits he kept in his hip pocket. He poured a touch upon the little finger of his right hand and opened Finn's mouth with his left. Then he massaged Finn's gums with a spirit-soaked finger. The spirits will dull the boy's pain, said he. Now it was bad enough to have Cucullin in one's house, but to sit back and take his little finger in the mouth was unpardonable. Now just a little bit more, laddie. Ah, said Cucullin as he lovingly administered another dose. You know, Mrs. McCool, I think after I've made your husband's acquaintance, I will take a wife so that I may have a son just like yours. It's the teeth way in the back of his mouth that are the worst, said Una. You're such a help kind man. And at that moment, Una decided to take matters into her own hands. She grabbed the pot that hung in the hearth, and rearing back, she hurled it at the head of the giant with all her might. Instead of Cucullin, however, the pot struck poor Finn dead upon the crown. The concussion was so great that Finn clamped down upon Cucullin's little finger, which was still applying the spirits, lopping it off at the third knuckle. Oh, look what the boy has done to me! Cucullin groaned, holding his maimed right hand. I'm finished!
You see, the giant's huge strength all lay in the very little finger of his right hand, which Finn had accidentally separated from its master. Cacullin then let loose with another ear-shattering scream. Then right before the eyes of Finn and Una, he shrunk from the size of a giant to that of a timid little church mouse. Now, Una and Finn had a large tomcat who liked to sleep behind the stove. But all the commotion woke him, and when he came out to investigate, there stood the oddest-looking mouse he had ever seen. Without much ado, the tomcat chased the screaming former giant down Lockmany, around the locks, and across the fields right into the sea. Glory be! said Finn in triumph. There isn't a giant in all of air as great as myself. I have defeated the great Cucullin. Una picked up her newly dented pot and gazed meaningfully into her dear husband's eyes. Er, uh, or perhaps should I say, we have defeated the great Cucullin. And truer words were never spoken. Mm -hmm.